This is TREP Wire Week in Review for week ending November 20th. I'm Martha Kocher with TREP, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of Siri Finance. This week, COVID hospitalizations in the U.S. are going up 25% week over week, spurring many governors to declare very restrictive measures as we head into Thanksgiving week. Meanwhile, economic news was a mixed bag. New jobless claims disappointed, existing home sales blew by expectations, manufacturing activity and retail sales slowed last month. We did, however, start the week with a more promising vaccine news as companies begin the FDA approval process. But Wall Street erased some gains after the news about New York City schools closing. Manus third quarter retail earnings showed that pandemic driven shopping is still surging So we are seeing resilience in the face of a lot of uncertainty. Well, we are seeing some positive numbers, although the stocks of those firms that did beat on the top line and the bottom line didn't really get uh, any kind of bump from the numbers. But when you scratch beneath the surface, those that did well, and that would include Walmart, Target, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, TJ Maxx, Um, they all seem to do better because they were executing much more efficiently and gaining market share through their their e-commerce portals. You know, that may not be completely true of Walmart and Target that really seem to continue to um, get a lot of foot traffic. But in addition to that foot traffic, both have really executed on the e-commerce platform and that has really juiced sales. And I think that they will come out of this pandemic better than many um, for having invested heavily in this and pulled it off so that even when the pandemic starts to recede, they will remain winners. And I think those that have failed to capitalize on this um, buy from home trend will face a, uh, in Joe Biden's terms, a dark winter that will extend into Uh, spring, summer, and fall, I hate to say. Well, if you look at the retailers that have weathered this storm fairly well, there there are all the obvious things, right? Maybe lower priced, um, much more uh, online presence. They've figured out the the pickup at the store, the curbside. They figured all that out, right? And that's partly due to the fact that they're smart and they have a ton of resources. But the, the thing that I find interesting is that the uh, one of the common themes, I think, across some of these names is the, uh, the brand or the lack of branding, right? So there is no value to me when I'm purchasing something online, uh, buying something that's a, that's a high cost brand name item versus a medium or lower cost non-brand name item. Right. So the, the, the Saks Fifth Avenue and the, the Ralph Lauren and the other things, especially in the, the era of zoom where you can only see my neck up. Um, like I'm fine with buying my pants from Kohl's and I'm fine with, you know, ordering my, uh, my rug for my house from Walmart and all these other things, you know, like, I feel like the We talked about this with the Oscar de la Renta thing a while ago on Amazon. I feel like the value of the brand with these types of consumer goods is not as high as it used to be. Well, you just took an arrow to my heart there, calling Kohl's low end. I spent the uh, (laughs) second half of my professional career in uh, Kohl's dockers. It's not low end, uh, it's medium end. (laughs) I love Kohl's. I'm a, uh, a big fan. I don't know if anyone would call your pants medium end though. Medium end? They're medium end <laughs> until they start fraying by the by the cuff <laughs> and then they become low end. Until because you I start do, not able to button the button. You know, <laughs> I wear everything until it is uh, really unusable in any form whatsoever. Even once my shorts go, I'm still wearing the, you know, the Elastic waistband around my head waist. as a sweatband. So... <laughs> But that's who I am, you know, but I do like the Coles blazers. I like their button down shirts and, uh, you know, maybe people were snickering behind my back at the water cooler, but Hey, look, I'm 57 <laughs> years old. You know, you know, you get to the point we don't care anymore. <laughs> you were 57 years old when you were 27 years old. <laughs> that's right. Um, 
Well, I, you know, it's just an interesting thing. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some, uh, you know, marketing majors uh, out there in college right now writing their uh, thesis, thesis papers about this. But the Amazon effect or the online shopping effect, like when, especially these soft goods, like who cares about the brand anymore? I think, you know, with technology and like hardware and devices and things like that, that's probably still relevant. But I'm looking at these names, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's, TJ Maxx, Kohl's, like reporting strong earnings. What do they do? They just provide like decent stuff at a decent price and they deliver it to your door quickly. Like that's just all it is. Like there's right. no more, again, there's, we're going to talk about it later, Madison Avenue, but there's no more of this kind of high street kind of luxury allure, or at least it's much, much lower than it used to be because right. I it's can't wear my strawberry jelly. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> there's no <laughs> Nabisco or some that's right. just that's strawberry right. jelly. Well, it's that's funny like that, Kirkland. Uh, that's yeah, Kirkland, exactly. Right. It's, it's funny that you say that Joe, because I think JC Penny, who's been struggling uh, for some time, they've just launched a, you ready for this word? Style leisure line. And style leisure? Style leisure. It's basically style like some sort of disease. Leisure type clothing. And uh, it's, you know, obviously at the low end of uh, the cost spectrum. It was always that guy in, in high school that walked around with a t-shirt that looked like it had a tuxedo, right? It was... <laughs> <laughs> So maybe that'll be the, the new trend, right? It's a t-shirt that combines, you know, the outside will look like a blazer and the inside will look like a button down shirt, you know, maybe something a little stylish, maybe a tie in there. I guess that's the other thing though. Like, you know, that would, my thesis would think that a JCPenney should do okay because they sell stuff for cheap, but they only really sell clothing. Whereas like every other one of these things, you can get your, um, you know, your strawberry jelly and your underwear and your mop and right. You can get like anything you want in that store or on their website, same with Amazon. So nobody's seeking out JC Penny for a pair of stretchy pants to work from home in, right. They're going to Amazon. They're hoping I came to do. home from Walmart this week with a record player, a Crosley. I would say it's a, uh, baby egg blue record player and i came back with three vinyls i had gotten rid of my vinyl a long time ago but i came back with revolver from the beatles and looking over there miles davis my kind of blue and then for something more modern a zach brown wow vinyl. so that was my uh that was my day what a hipster really there we is. go <laughs> it uh yes it, it made my uh my review of some of these dreary commercial real estate numbers a little bit less dreary. As we talk about, uh, you were talking about um, Thanksgiving and uh, closing uh, stores and schools and, and socially distancing. I'm wondering if we'll see a wave of things previously ignored in the, uh, the sales numbers in December. And uh, I was just talking with my dad the other day, you know, 45 years consecutively running his Thanksgiving. And this year will be just a dribble as, as people fall by the wayside. But we were talking about whether we should be plywooding the windows, you know, conversing via, via big whiteboard, right? So uh, people don't know how many people are in the house talking, big bags of ruffles so you can stick your phones in them so they're not traceable by the uh, <laughs> authorities and maybe some voice alteration devices. So everybody sounds exactly the same. Very creative. Very creative. But looking at hotels this week, an arbiter ruled that New York City owners will have to pay more than $500 million to employees displaced by COVID, which sounds like good news for the workers, but can the hoteliers handle that? Man, it is a tough slog for hotel guys right now. In addition to that, right, that, that's kind of the latest thing. We've talked about in past episodes that when you come out of this, you know, you have this increased cost of cleaning, right? Everybody's going to expect uh, a much higher level of disinfectant and um, evidence that you're using the strongest possible stuff to remove any uh, potential, um, you know, viruses. Um, this week we saw, uh, and we may talk about this later, 
Starbucks and Home Depot announced that they were raising uh, the minimum wage for their employees. Those, those hikes in Starbucks case was going to be 10%. Home Depot was going to make permanent their previously announced raises. And, and those places are competing with some of the same workforce that you need, right? So if Starbucks and Home Depot is bumping up their hourly wage by, by two bucks, you know, that goes right to the hotel guy too, right? He's got to pay an extra two bucks as does, you know, the guy at McDonald's and the guy at Subway and everybody else. And, and the thing about Starbucks is they can endure it. They could pass it through to the customer. The hotel guy can't. And so not only is it no demand, not only is it when there is demand, you know, people want, uh, you know, rock bottom rates. Now you have, you know, the threat of, um, you know, higher labor costs coming through. So, uh, man, that's rough. Well, let's not get it twisted. If Starbucks raises their wages by 10%, you know for a fact that they're going to be raising the price of a medium cup of coffee by 33% is my guess. Um, I was thinking it's, it's, it's kind of just, it's unfair almost. And it's not, I, I wouldn't use that word in reality, but it just comes to mind. Like it's unfair that a hotel a hotelier uh, would have to compete against a Starbucks for workers because Starbucks has something that is relative, has a, a good that has relatively steady demand or inelastic demand, right? It, it doesn't really change whether you have a, a pandemic or not, or whether you have, you know, your coffee is $3 and 50 cents or $4 and 50 cents, right? They're still able to maintain that volume and revenue. Whereas obviously the hotels are in a totally different ball game uh, and they're competing. You know, Starbucks is not competing against the bagel shop across the street, right? These people are going to go get their Starbucks coffee. They're not going to go to the bagel shop, even though bagel shop coffee is probably just as good and you can get it for a buck. Um, whereas the hotel, you know, the, the, the Hilton garden Inn is across the street from the Hampton Inn is across the street from the residence in, and so on and so on. And people are going to go online and find the lowest possible price. Right. And, and this is going to apply not just to the hotel guys, it's going to be to retailers, right? Just because yeah. Walmart can bump up their compensation for their workers, they can do it because they've been executing better. Um, but the other bricks and mortar guys are going to have to, um, match uh to get people to come in and work for them you know and that's going to drive their costs up as well and they don't have the tailwind of uh, a strong e-commerce uh growing franchise like a walmart does or a target or, or, or others so um <laughs> it's funny we had a lot of good news this week with vaccines right we not only do we have a vaccine two weeks ago with pfizer uh this week with moderna and there's a race to the top, right? Pfizer was 90%, 90 Moderna 95. was 94%. Now Pfizer came back and said it's 95%. So it's, it's a race to the top, uh, which is great news. Um, but there is still a lot of, uh, there's a big tail out there, which is going to weigh on hotels and retailers uh, for, for quite a while. So this uh, survey that Martha was talking, well, she, she talked about... Uh, the ruling that these uh, union operated hotels are going to have to pay out uh, to their workers. But there was uh, something else that Martha had pointed out, uh, a survey from AHLA, which is a, a hotel uh, union, a hotel workers union, says that 70% of uh, hotel owners won't make it another six months without federal assistance. Now, obviously, they have a vested interest in getting federal assistance. So uh, that number might be slightly high. But uh, it's, it's there nonetheless. Um, what was the, Martha, the stat that you were mentioning before? Well, they every... are, they are a trade organization that represents the hoteliers. And so they are extremely concerned that without any federal assistance, um, not only do they have to lay off even more workers, but they're going to have to close. Um, many of them will be fo forced to close by the end of this year. The, the stat that I think you're referring to, Joe, is the one where uh, Chip Rogers, who's the president and CEO of the organization, said that every hour that Congress doesn't act, hotels lose 400 jobs. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing about this, this time, um, you know, it's usually in many ways the, the salad days or, you know, the 
just like there's Black Friday, there's, there's Black December for hotels as people travel to their relatives to uh, celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah and, and New Year's and they travel to uh, vacation destinations or New York to see the tree and what a sad tree that was in New York this year. That was, you know, we'll talk but about it. It had an later. owl in it. It had an owl. Goodness. But, um, you know, this, this was typically the kind of. You got to wait till they dress it all up, man. It's, you can't judge it by what uh, it looks like on the truck. Yeah, the branches have to fall. The branches have to fall. I don't know. That was you a sad that looking is. tree, man. I was looking for, for Linus to go out there and, and wrap the <laughs> bottom of it with his, uh, with his, with his blanket. blanket. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> Poor thing. Uh, well, on the subject of hotels, we released a report this week, and there were some interesting takeaways about uh, where the distress is, Joe. Yeah, so uh, just a couple of high points. Um, you should check it out at uh, trep.com, the research report. But uh, if you break the hotel sector down by subtype, uh, not just the, the broad hotel uh, property type, but things like limited service, full service, extended stay, things like that. Uh, limited uh, service hotels were at the highest end of the delinquency spectrum with, uh, what is it, almost 25%. Um, whereas extended stay and full service hotels are, are on the lower end near like 15 and 17% respectively. Uh, just looking over into the actual report itself, just some kind of numbers without context here. Delinquent loan balances in the top 10 MSAs, hotels, New York, 1.5, oh, sorry, 1.15 billion, Chicago, 1.03 billion, LA, 1.03 billion, Houston, 750, Portland, 565. Uh, that's 750 million, 565 million. So just to give you a sense, this is, this is a huge swath of outstanding balance that's delinquent right now. Uh, the rate that was kind of sorted by, M by uh, delinquent balance, the rates on the top 10, the highest looks like uh, Portland, uh, not so surprising at 78%. Houston, 76%. They had their troubles even before COVID and then just kind of got double whammied. And then you've got 57% in Chicago, 30% in New York, and so on down the line. So uh, I really hope that there is um, a stimulus deal, uh, you know, penned in the next month or two. I, uh, I don't know how a stimulus deal might end up helping out a, a hotel owner, um, maybe if it's some sort of PPP type situation. Um, but... God willing that that uh, vaccine gets out as quickly as possible and we start to see people, you know, trickling back into the uh, airports and the hotels and the beach resorts and everything else. Maybe we could start a movement on the TREP podcast. Support your local hotel. Urge this year's stocking stuffer to be a hotel gift certificate, right? To a place that, uh, you know, could use the help. Right, somewhere that, uh, and it's a great gift, right? Who doesn't like to, to get their hotel room paid for? Hint, hint. Exactly. And uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we can make that the Trep Pod movement, right? I'll take mine in Miami, please. <laughs> Everybody go out there, and uh, it's a great way to not have to go to the, uh, you know, outside your home to purchase it. You could probably purchase it online and, uh, put it in a nice decorative box with a little ribbon and uh, you're all set. I don't know. What about the retailers that are, we, we got to get a Jason. Now we got to get a JC Penny uh, gift card too. Well, people have been doing that for a long time, right? It's always been a big uh, <laughs> gift card, gift card thing. Right. And this will probably, yeah, you're be right. Same, There's, I've never seen a, a hotel gift card. So there we go. Good Support idea. Support your local. We get, you need to come up with a good acronym for it though. Yeah, if there's any hoteliers out there, email us at podcast.trep.com and we'll, uh, we will uh, be open to your ideas on how we get this going. Anything to help the cause. <laughs> the double tree in uh, Southwest Idaho. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You're the winner. Manis, uh, you're working on some trip wire stories. What are you working on? 
Yeah, we got a couple of big stories that are coming out Friday morning, just to orient everybody. We are uh, broadcasting or taping this as we normally do on Thursday evening. Uh, so this would be November 19th. Uh, a couple of big ones coming out Friday morning. Um, a $30 million loan on the 545 Madison Avenue property was resolved with a loss of, wait for it, 97%, $29.2 million. We had written about a year ago that the servicer had stopped advancing um, at that time. So we knew something was amiss. The loan had been with special servicer since May of 2019. The note made up almost 4% of the collateral behind uh, a JP Morgan deal, 2014 C18. The collateral had about 140,000 square feet. It was categorized as office in the original uh, deal documents, but it really had a lot of income coming in from street level retail. Uh, Panache Bridal and Dunhill were two of the big retailers there. They vacated in recent years, which really weighed on the property. But in addition, um, there was an increase in the ground lease cost, uh, which was substantial. So at the end of the day, this property, which was um, used as collateral for a $30 million loan about six years ago, uh, it was valued at $55 million, now got liquidated for something you know like a million dollars. And, and that's a big story. Uh, we've talked about New York City retail uh, as a concern and other major 24-hour city retail as concerns. Uh, here, it, it brings it home. So that's one of the things we'll see Friday morning. On a more positive note, the J.P. Morgan 2011 C3 deal, uh, obviously coming up on almost 10 years old, two of the biggest loans left in that deal are a $180 million Holyoke Mall loan. That's about 1.4 million square feet of collateral in Holyoke Mass. Makes up almost 40% of that deal. The other loan is a $53 million note on Sangertown Square Mall. Sangertown Square is in upstate New York, in New Hartford. Both of those loans were slated to mature in early 2021. Uh, a lot of eyes were with them, on them. Uh, together, these two loans made up more than 50% of the remaining balance on the JP Morgan uh, deal that I was referring to before. The sponsor on both notes was Pyramid, who's a mall operator in the Northeast, a bunch of New York and Pennsylvania properties. They negotiated a three-year extension, which pushes out the maturity date of both loans to 2024. So on the retail side, the positive story there is, you know, Pyramid is fighting for these properties. Um, they're trying to make them work, which is great for investors. The special servicer saw enough value in these to meet Pyramid at, at a level which said, we're going to give you three years to uh, try to see this through, which was a, a sign of faith that Pyramid could pull this off. But turning to the bond trading side of it, one thing that is very, very interesting is that the IO holder in this deal now gets three extra years potentially of additional cash flow. And that's a, such a huge win for the bond holder uh, in that. You know, th these loans may not go out the entire three years. They could be prepaid before then. But the IO holder now gets this windfall of extra cash that will carry them for another three years. Um, in addition, you know, the coupon on, on some of these uh, fixed pay P&I bonds is hefty. They were issued 10 years ago when interest rates were a lot higher. So some of these bonds will hang out a lot longer with the owners of these collecting some nice fat uh, interest payments for quite a while. That interest only uh, extension concept has been a thread that has come up in every podcast for the last like three or four weeks. That's We're nothing if not repetitive. <laughs> I, I think of it as thorough. <laughs> thorough. They're <laughs> thoroughbreds. <laughs> but, but you look at these, these bonds, you know, the B, C, D, E classes of this, you know, their coupons are in the high force. Right. So when you're talking about if, if this money came through to these bondholders and they were going to have to put it back into work, right, put it out there again in new financing, you would be getting closer to, I don't know, 2%? give or take, right? Maybe less. 
And now there's the potential for you to get, you know, almost 5% on these bonds for another three years. So, um, so a good story all around. And we had a couple of good deals of the week, Manus. Yeah, it, it was uh, going into Thanksgiving. We have some things to be thankful for. You know, we, as we said, that extension is something certainly to be thankful for, for bond investors and for those that want to see green shoots in the, the mall and, and retail spaces. So um, that was one thing to be thankful for. I'm going to give you two others, which I thought were just terrific. The first one is street level retail in Los Angeles. So the property is 457 and 459 Rodeo Drive. It's Rodeo uh, Drive. Actually. Rodeo Drive. Yeah. <laughs> um, Don't say that. Don't you say that. <laughs> <laughs> You're throwing me off my game. So both of these stories, by the way, come from the real deal. So I uh, want to give credit where it's due. Crown Equity and Ascendant capital sold these proper this property or these properties these two addresses for 122 million dollars uh that's for a 10,500 square foot property 20 percent more than they paid for it in 2018 uh the property is leased to alexander mcqueen and brioni although brioni is leaving uh vacating its parcel which is about a third of the space bought by a european investor the sellers paid $76.8 million for this loan. Uh, the loan was split across two CRE CLOs, which have now paid off this week. And uh, the deal was brokered by Jay Lukes. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that properly. Uh, Vice Chairman of Newmark. So our headline in the Trump Wire story a couple of days ago, just when you thought retail was dead, or street level retail, we got this story in. So... Uh, we love this one. Um, the other was equally uh, interesting. Um, hotels, which have, of course, had uh, an ex extraordinarily difficult time uh, finding financing, um, got some financing for a South Florida property. So there's a merger of three families down in the Miami um, area, the Ben Joseph Group, uh, the Canavos family and the Lowenstein families, they own two Ritz-Carlton hotels and, and also the Sagamore. Ben Joseph Group owns the Sagamore. And uh, the other two families own Flag Luxury and Lionstone, uh, if I have the corporate structure correct. So they merged. They now fall under the same umbrella. Deutsche Bank provided, Deutsche Bank and BHI USA provided a $230 million refi of those properties, which is just terrific that we're seeing uh, somebody step up to the plate and provide financing for this part of the market that has been so heavily hit. And it did result in a $160 million payoff of a single asset deal. Um, the Ritz-Carlton South Beach uh, paid off this, this month. So two really uh, positive stories, one for retail and one for hotels. So uh, th those are great stories, but I'm going to take the other side of the coin here and say that we we're talking about street level retail on Rodeo Drive, where uh, the Mighty Ducks had a great uh, shopping spree, if you all remember. Oh, that's my millennial check of the day. Uh, and then you have the Ritz Carlton in South Beach. So... I will be much more excited when your deal of the week is the limited service hotel in Southwest Idaho getting refied or getting sold. I think people are, people are willing to do deals on these types of, you know, super high end um, areas, right? I'll bid you back. And I'll say this, that, you know, we've seen really big distress in New York city yeah. hotel and in Madison Avenue and fifth Avenue retail. So I don't care where this is, you know, this could be, uh, you know, the Sultan of Brunei's private, uh, you know, lair for shopping by himself, you as know, long as it gets a deal demand, done. <laughs> you know, financing is financing sale is a sale. And I don't care where it comes from. It, it is just a green shoot. I think the first one was the Sultan of Brioni, except they're <laughs> vacating. 
Do you know, evening. do you, uh, do you remember the CRE CLO deals that that one was in? Do you have that in uh, front of you? were two no? LCRE deals, one from 2019, Is one from ladder? 2018. I'm going off memory here. Uh, floating rate loans. Yeah. One was 56 million. The other piece was 20 million, give or take. And they both paid off this month. So I think that's ladder, right? Ladder capital. So, um, but that's, uh, I love seeing that because that's the whole point of those types of loans, those bridge loans that go into series CLOs. The whole point is to give the owner some time to either retenant the place or, you know, do some changes or, or do some sort of transition and then get back into long-term financing uh, or to sell the property. So that's great to see that that's that kind of the business plan actually getting executed. It's a big part of the market, right? It does cover a big part of that um, hole between long-term 10-year fixed uh, fixed rate product and everything else, right? So spot and on. And it's something we haven't been able, we haven't seen in the, I mean, we saw this kind of stuff sometimes, I guess, in CDOs back in the day, but like to see a, a healthy CRE, CLO issuance market means that we get, you know, Manus and I and the TREP folks get to see more of these types of loans and, and watch their stories happen. So those, and a lot of times they're a little, they're probably more interesting than the long-term fixed rate deal, right? There's a movie in there somewhere. <laughs> Earlier this week, we spoke with Adam Bellman of Starwood Property Trust, and we're going to be dropping that podcast next Tuesday. For those of you that don't know, he's president of their investment and servicing business line. It was an interesting conversation. And the conversation got Manus thinking a little bit about doing a deep dive on hedging. Well, we do listen to a lot of earnings calls from the REITs or read them as the case may be. Joe's a listener and I'm a, I'm a reader. So we normally read the Starwood stuff as we do with, you know, Boston Properties and um, so many others, Simon and, and so forth. Um, and it was just timely that their earnings call came before we spoke to spoke about Adam. And, and, and there was a lot of uh, good, good color from him about the state of the market. But the earnings call itself uh, with Barry Sternlich was just very, very positive. Um, not entirely positive. He was concerned about 24 hour cities and, and, and certain parts of the market, but, um, he did give a, you know, generally upbeat part of, you know, uh, view into we will come out of this and we will be better. So for those that uh, didn't see it or didn't listen to it, it's, you know, kind of um, chicken soup for the um, over bearish soul in the commercial real estate market. But one thing, and we're going to turn to our educational segment at this point that he talked about was hedging their origination book. So Starwood makes their money in, in many ways. They operate a conduit, which means that they are lending um, to borrowers. That, that lending facility gets warehoused for a while, and then it goes into CMBS deals, permanent CMBS financing. So they may hold on to loans for 30 or 60 days, 90 days, maybe probably on the outside. Um, they run a, a special servicing business and, and, uh, and other things are very well diversified. Um, so much so that I should disclose this, I invested in them after uh, I heard the earnings call. But when they originate, what they try to do is hedge. What they want to do is make sure that whatever they lent on, that the profit they locked in that day is immutable, right? So it's not that different from a farmer who decides at one part of the year that he's going to plant corn instead of soybeans. And he says, if I'm going to go down this road, I want to know what my exit price is in nine months or 12 months or however long it takes to, to grow corn. So he signs up a futures contract, which says, I'm going to be selling you this, this corn at four bucks a bushel in you know July or whenever, however it works. Here, the Starwood guys or anybody else who runs a conduit, so there'll be Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, the minute they originate a loan, they want to hedge it against something which says that we are going to be able to sell this loan at the exact same profit, ideally, that we would make two months from now as we would make today. So let's suppose that they made a 3% office loan today 
and they knew that they could securitize it all in with the IO and and all the bonds factored in at 275. They'd be making a 25 basis point profit. What they don't want to happen is for interest rates to go up, treasuries to go up 100 basis points and them to be underwater. Obviously, they'd have to sell that loan at a loss and they don't want spreads to go against them. They don't want spreads to blow out 100 basis points so that you know they lent perhaps at 200 basis points over the 10 year, but now they have to borrow in the CMBS market at 250 basis points over or 300. That would be a losing proposition. So what they do is they go out and hedge this so that if spreads compress, they make more money on their loan in the securitization side, but they lose money on their hedge. But in a perfect world, it's equal and opposite. So they're indifferent to whether spreads go in or out. If spreads go out, they lose money on their securitization side, but they make money on their hedge. And that's, that's really the goal. The interesting side of it is, we, we've never seen this disclosed in an earnings call, is A, that they hedge about 30% of their product. And you know that is, it's not 100%, it's not 70%, it's 30% of what they're doing is what they do. And um, that is something we never knew before. So hopefully that made sense um, to people. We kind of ran through that very quickly. If, if it didn't, please ping us and we're happy to get on the phone or, or to answer questions. But it is a vehicle to basically lock in your profit the day you make your loan. Well, and there are probably a couple of ways that they do it, right? I mean, I know that some conduits will short CMBX, right? Um, or long CMBX, I guess, whichever side of the case they're on. Or the, you know, what other ways are there? Whether they have interest rate swaps or something like that? Right. Adam did say this. He didn't say it on the podcast, but he did say it offline, was that when there were total return swaps on the CMBS market, it was a much more efficient hedge mm -hmm. back in the day that uh, CMBS or CMBX is not the greatest hedge because they do detach cash spreads right. and derivative spreads can go um, in different directions or in the same direction, but of, of different magnitudes. So I'll, I'll bring up a separate aside. You know, one thing that he remarked on was that the greatest hedge is being able to securitize very fast, yeah. right? So you don't have money sitting around waiting for things to go wrong. So, he, you know, he talks about the velocity of money, getting things out and securitize very quickly. But it does bring up a, a you know, a piece of CMBS history, uh, CMBS trivia, if you will, that in the 90s, people would wait months and months and months to securitize. So Nomura would sometimes sit on, you know, five to 10 to $20 billion worth of product and securitize twice a year. What we saw in the late 90s was the long-term capital hedge fund blow up, which had the potential to um, mutate and uh, have a contagion, a financial instability contagion that could have touched other banks. And they were basically um, bought out or, or covered uh, by a consortium of 16 investment banks. But spreads blew out at that time. And all of a sudden, Nomura um, found themselves uh, on the wrong side of that trade and lost a lot of money as a result of not hedging this, you know, being very long uh, CRE paper at the time. So what that did is deals started getting smaller and conduit issuers started to issue almost as quickly as they could. So, you know, every two months, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Citibank at the time, uh, First Union had a hedge, Wachovia, they were all pumping these things out as fast as they could to elim eliminate that risk. Eventually, towards the great financial crisis, people started getting friskier and they started to see instead of $1 billion deals, $2 billion, $3 billion, $4 billion, $5 billion, $7 billion. And that reintroduced the problem of if things went haywire, you had a lot of money at risk. And, and that was part of the problem among many that bit Lehman Brothers towards the end. They had a lot of commercial real estate exposure uh, that went against them. It wasn't their only problem, but it was a problem. So you want to be like Zara. You want to go, going back to my uh, undergrad business school days when that was the uh, the case study, you want that just-in-time inventory. You don't want to be stuck with a lot of clothes on the shelf. You don't want to be stuck with a lot of loans on the shelf, right? Yeah. We, last week, Joe threw in a quick line. I'm going to 
you know, take a detour here. He threw uh -oh. in a very quick. What did I say? R, you know, rest in peace, Alex Trebek. But it did have me thinking that, you know, one of my dreams would that someday, instead of being like student week or teacher week or celebrity week, they'd have CMBS week <laughs> on uh, Jeopardy. And you guys would be ready. Wow. Like, you know, I'll take uh, conduit originators for 800. <laughs> and, or whomever the new guy will be. I'll take uh, 1998 Hotel Hope Note deal in Southwest Idaho for 2000, Alex. You'll have like a thousand. Who do you think, so Manis, if you're on that, if you're one of those guys, who are the other two people that are going to be on that show? Well, you got to say Trish Hall would be one of them. She is one of the real um, backbones. I hope I'm not embarrassing her by mentioning her name of having built um, the reporting package for CMBS, the IRP and the data standards. Um, you know, I would think that she would be uh, the equivalent of that guy who'd ran off 75 straight uh, victories. Ken Jennings or Dan Holzauer? Either one, <laughs> either one. And then, goodness, there's so many other people that um, we could throw out there. It, it's really hard to- Let's just say Tom Fink, make Tom him happy. Fink. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's just, um, I'm gonna come back to you next week with my, my top five. So, uh, so listen next week for our top five of who, you know, in addition to Trish Hall, um, would be our ideal uh, Jeopardy contestants. That's right. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that would have record breaking, you know, demand, right? I think that that would, uh, which record, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it would easily surpass, you know, when they have on, you know, the, uh, the people like, uh, John Goodman or, uh, celebrity Jeopardy, you know, yeah. celebrity Jeopardy, <laughs> Alice Cooper, Gene Simmons, and it leads us to shout outs of the week, Manis. Uh, besides the Jeopardy contestants, uh, do you have any shout outs? Well, I have one. Um, BS, who not only do we talk about the state of the market in, in, at length, but uh, we also talked about how uh, dry the programming, the sports programming menu is these days without there being college basketball. Usually this time of year, you'd see tons of Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan State, Stanford, all these great teams, Gonzaga, playing every single night. And uh, I was really looking forward to that, especially now that COVID is really kind of sinking us back into shutdown all over again. Um, but there's none, and that's uh, that's quite disappointing. So my shout-out is, is to BS. And we have some shout outs that came in through Twitter. So it uh, took us a couple of weeks to wrangle those. We had Ed M, Vincent D, who Joe said he made it through the Cecil tutorial. So we should congratulate Kudos. him for that. Austin S said the pod is exactly what they're looking for. Vivian W in New Jersey gave us a recommendation on Twitter. And Joe A, who answered our question, what's your uh, least favorite song? Well, he wrote, Best song is I'm a Gummy Bear after the first listen, and worst song is I'm a Gummy Bear after the 300th listen, I think in the vein of that Baby Shark song. So um, Sounds like a guy with young kids. No doubt. And uh, he was interested in our stress test results for banks, which uh, leads us uh, to the concept that we were going to cover a couple weeks ago. We noted that there were two bank failures in October, which brought the 2020 number to four, not really a record by any means, but it does suggest that the pace of bank failures may be accelerating. What should we be watching for there? So I think, you know, early indicators or common early indicators to look at are the lost reserves. So these, this is what banks are holding against expectations of future losses. Uh, we've talked about Cecil ad nauseum on this podcast, but now that you actually have to reserve on all of your loans, um, it should, at least if the banks are doing what they're supposed to do based on the guidance, it should be a true indicator of what the bank expects to take uh, in losses, essentially for the rest of time on the loans on their balance sheet on every, at, at every particular quarter. And 
from Q2 to Q3, reserves actually were relatively flat to slightly lower. So, which makes sense because the outlook, the economic outlook from Q2 to Q3 has drastically improved. Um, we didn't have the uh, vaccine at that point, but we did have a lot of recovery and people getting their jobs back and things like that. So, uh, although we're seeing some uh, second wave effects right now in terms of COVID and shutdowns and things like that, but uh, I hope that you know we can plow through this. Uh, and that you wouldn't, you won't see these reserves kind of significantly increasing in Q4. The other thing that uh, we, we wanted to mention, and Matt Anderson actually pointed this out, is that the CARES Act uh, basically allowed banks to um, not account for loans that were not paying in the normal not paying account. So like usually when a loan doesn't pay for a while, the bank has to put it into a different category, which then um, gets counted against their capital and there's all sorts of regulatory treatments and processes that you have to go through when a loan gets into that category. They, the CARES Act basically gave banks a 180 day pass on that, but that 180 days is up, uh, or it's going to be up next month. So I, we may see a big increase in Q4 non-accrual rates. Uh, so we'll keep our eye out open for that. You, you bring up Matt Anderson and, you know, one thing that he built several years ago was a vehicle. It went through decades worth of call report data, um, macroeconomic data, things like unemployment, uh, the 10-year treasury, um, stock market indices, home price uh, indexes, commercial property values, and so forth. And he, along with Kathy Yu uh, at our organization, built this enormous regression analysis, which allows actually our users to go through uh, any bank they want to from the, you know, SIFI banks to, you know, the, the $50 million community bank and run them through a stress test. And what that does is it allows uh, our front end to put in stress scenarios and come up with what kind of uh, non-accruals um, each bank will see from their Resi portfolio, their CNI portfolio, their commercial portfolio, how, how that will impact loan reserves, loss reserves, how that will impact earnings, how a falling 10 year treasury would uh, be reflected in net operating income or net income from the bank and so forth. So it's an interesting tool. We developed it really for those banks that had to do Dodd stress, Dodd Frank stress testing, um, but it does apply to all. And uh, when you look at these banks, there are some that are very heavily impacted or, or weighted with commercial real estate lending. And, and those will be the ones to watch in 2021 if uh, that commercial real estate overweighting, if you will, by those banks turns into either higher loss reserves, smaller equity positions, or um, enforcement actions by the regulators. So if anybody's interested in seeing that tool, um, we'll give you Matt Anderson's uh, VAT number. Yeah. And, you know, for better or for worse, commercial real estate has been at, I wouldn't, maybe not the center, but has been a, a, a large player in a lot of the losses that occurred in prior downturns. So because of that, uh, it happens to be, you know, square in the middle of most regulators radar as well. So there's all sorts of capital rules for banks that have certain exposure to commercial real estate. And that plus this whole new Cecil reserving standard may actually, I don't know if this is true or not. It's a, it's a gut feeling, but banks usually do prune their portfolio in, in times of stress, right? They may sell off pieces of their portfolio. They may uh, act differently than they would in a normal time. And I think that that activity may be accelerated this time around or slightly accelerated this time around due to um, this whole Cecil concept. So I don't know if that's true. We'll see if it's true, but it's just what my gut's telling me. It's almost like a terrible feedback loop in a way, right? Because in that period when you're making assumptions that are a little bit more draconian, your value fall, falls. And if you're of that mindset where when this kicks in, I want to sell, it almost is ensuring that you're going to be selling low every time. So it may take some kind of discipline for the banks to say, I know this looks bad, but we got to wait this out. Yeah. Well, it's everything that all the anti-CECL folks 
we're talking about before Cecil was was finalized. So that it's pro cyclical and you know it'll cause people to lend even less during downturns and stuff like that. So, but we won't bore you anymore with that. No one's no one's asleep. They're they're enwrapped at the end of their seats. The CDC is urging Americans to stay home for Thanksgiving and not travel. But even before that announcement, it seemed that only about 35% of people were planning to travel by car down from 65% a year ago. So it sounds like smaller gatherings are in store this year. Maybe Thanksgiving for two, one. The late night fist fight over who's stealing $100 bills from the Monopoly banker is officially <laughs> called off this year. I think that we will have hit rock bottom if people are pivoting from the butterball with the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and the sweet potatoes and everything else to one of those Swanson frozen dinners, Ooh. right? If we're, if we're talking about Thanksgiving for two, it's, uh, I don't know, like how low can you go, right? With it, you know, the sliced turkey with the congealing gravy. And I would never get the cobbler. They always say there's a cobbler in there, but I always get like peas and carrots, Come on. Martha's dog just heard Butterball and went nuts. <laughs> he, thinks, uh, he thinks there's dinner on the table. I'm just picturing uh, Kramer on the roof, sunbathing, all slathered in butter. When Newman <laughs> comes up and sees him, he thinks he looks like a turkey. <laughs> well, I think we've covered so many dense items on this podcast. This may end up being the, the trip to fan podcast that uh oh that bunch. puts people to sleep we'll, nice. we'll have to find out so <laughs> i think nice. next week know. guys i think we're gonna we're gonna come out early next week um yes with the podcast i think yes. on wednesday yeah I, i'm thinking we should do a uh what are we grateful for segment it's it sounds idea. cheesy but i think i got some good ideas so stay tuned for that. all right well with that we will close thanks to our producer Keegan St. Ange may join us next week as we look at what has happened during the week and how it might be impacting you. If you have a question, drop us a comment at podcast at trep.com. For more info, visit trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>